Your voice was very faint. Uh, but uh, yeah, thank you so much for praying for us. The Lord did hear, and so the Lord will answer. Thank you so much. Yes. So we have covered three chapters of Colossians. Uh, we entered Colossians chapter 4. Uh, we did up to verse 6, looking at some basic things that Paul wanted to you know, instruct. Uh, and then verse 7 onwards, Colossians 4, verse 7 onwards, we have the concluding instructions being given. So I wanted us to you know, uh, focus a little bit on that because there are a few things there which can be of use to us. Uh, so we will begin with verse 7. So if we could have someone you know, read out for us um, Colossians 4, Verses 7 to uh, 11, Colossians 4, 7 to 11, if someone could read out for us, please. Colossians chapter 4, verse 7 to 11, Titus, a beloved brother, faithful uh, minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord will tell you all the news about me. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts with on Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. They will make known to you all things that are happening there. Aristra, because my fellow prisoner greet you, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you are received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is justice, does, uh, these are my um, only fellow workers for the kingdom of God, who are of the circumcision. They have proved to be a comfort to me. Thank you. So we just see some concluding remarks over here. Um, uh, Tychicus and Onesimus, uh, the two persons who are mentioned in verses 7 to 9, they are the people who actually carry this letter to the Colossians. Uh, so uh, Tychicus, uh, we get to know he is being sent specifically to give information about Paul uh, to the Colossian believers. Uh, because right now Paul is in imprisonment. Uh, so uh, the believers in Colosse are concerned about him. Uh, they probably want to know, you know how things are with him. So uh, Paul doesn't want them to stay worried and concerned. So he's sending Tychicus to carry news about him to the people uh, back in Colosse. As for Onesimus, Onesimus is being sent back uh, to Philemon because he had run away from Philemon. He was the slave of Philemon, and he had uh, chosen to run away. Uh, and in we don't really know the details of how he made his way all the way to Rome. But when he went over there, he probably you know met Paul at some point of time and became a believer. So Onesimus uh, is now a believer. So here in verse 9, we see Paul addressing him as our faith and dear brother who is one of you. He doesn't say that slave on Onesimus. That's not how he addresses him. He says uh, about Onesimus, a faithful and dear brother who is one of you. You know, so in Christ, you don't have slave and free. In Christ, you don't have Jew and barbarian. You know, in Christ, we don't have these uh, differentiations when it comes to our status. We all are of equal status, and we all are equally loved by God. Uh, so we are all part of one family. So here he addresses Onesimus as someone who is one of you. 
you know so he gives him that respect in the way he addresses him uh, we also have mention of aristarchus here uh, who it looks like has also been imprisoned along with paul so he refers to aristarchus as a fellow prisoner aristarchus is the person um, who had accompanied paul and the other and the rest of the team to ephesus uh, so in acts 19 28 to 29 um, when when we read about the riot which took place in ephesus you know when uh, the people were very very concerned uh, the local people were very concerned that everyone is turning away from you know the worship of their pagan gods and so they all uh, they come and they attack these uh, paul and his team so at that point in acts 19 28 to 29 we are told that the people seized gaius and aristarchus paul's traveling companions from macedonia and all of them rushed into the theater together is what it says over there in acts 19 29 so aristarchus is someone who had been serving along with paul uh, for a long time and uh, was very faithful and then we have mention of mark the cousin of barnabas so when mark had abandoned paul in, uh, during the first missionary journey and gone away uh, his cousin barnabas spoke on his behalf and you know said that he should be given a second chance but paul was not for that paul felt that someone who had abandoned them should not be given a second chance and barnabas you know spoke for mark so strongly and in fact it led to a you know a strong disagreement between these two ministers of god until finally barnabas decided that he would take mark and go separately on a, on a separate missionary journey uh, so because of the effort that barnabas put in and invested in mark's life it looks like mark you know um, came back to that earlier commitment which he which he had made and so he became a very strong uh, missionary and was of great help to uh, paul later so we see over here that even paul was not perfect he took a strict stand and felt that mark should not be given any second chances but because of the kindness of barnabas because barnabas was willing to give mark a second chance he was willing to pursue him talk to him counsel him and you know get him back into ministry you know mark um, his entire future ministry was blessed so uh, the reason that we are going through these concluding remarks is because there are things you know contained over here which can be beneficial to us in our own ministries so if we know any marks in our own ministry circles you know uh, like barnabas it is worth it to put in that little bit of extra investment and that little bit of extra effort because who knows that person may genuinely in their heart still love the lord and want to serve it's just that maybe they were scared away by circumstances or the toughness of the situation and all they needed was a little bit of encouragement and support from a fellow believer you know so if there are such marks in our ministries rather than just taking a very strict stand and saying i'm done with this person if we invest in them who knows you know they may they may be they may actually break out of that um, whatever it is that is holding them back and they may be willing to pursue the lord in serving and you know their their entire future ministry will be blessed so many people will be blessed through them and in heaven one day you know uh, we would be rewarded for making that extra investment and effort in helping that person get back on their feet so we see that about mark over here here paul says uh, when he comes to you you know welcome him so uh, he uh, he now respects mark uh, and he you know loves him and appreciates all that he has contributed towards the uh, ministry another thing that we um, yeah maybe this um, verse 11 yeah verse 11 is where uh, it talks about a person named jesus justice um who is also one of the team in rome and he says these are the only jews among my co-workers uh, so aristarchus mark and this jesus justice are the only jewish um, missionaries 
who are willing to identify with Paul and you know visit him, spend time with him, talk to him. All the other Jewish missionaries seem to have distanced themselves. They are scared, you know, how uh, um, how Paul's arrest will turn out whether he will be given a death sentence or not. And so they want to avoid any problems. So they all distance themselves from Paul. Paul had a much larger team earlier, but now the, all the other Jews are kind of scared. So they have backed off. But these three Jews, you see, even now, even though he's in prison and his court case is going on, they have chosen to stand by him. So this, again, is a beautiful practical, you know, point that we see regarding ministry, where even when there's opposition and uh, persecution, some believers will choose to stay you know, with those who are in jail. They will choose to, to uh, attend the court appearances, even though it may draw negative attention to them. They are willing to take a stand for this believer uh, who is getting persecuted in jail or being, you know, being pursued by the police. Uh, so when we do that, you know, uh, there's a special blessing, I think, for such people because it says here, you know, Paul says here, they have proved a comfort to me. So these three Jewish missionaries who chose to stick with Paul, they were such a comfort to him. They they were a blessing to Paul. You know, so a reward would really be given to them for what they for the stand which they took. So this is another you know principle that we can keep in mind. Uh, a third beautiful thing that we see is regarding Epaphras, who founded this church in Colossae. And if you remember, it was not Paul who planted this church. It was Epaphras who had been trained under Paul in Ephesus. So he comes over here and he starts this church over here. And it says about him, um, he's always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God. I mean, the word that is used over there, it's not just saying that he's interceding or that he's praying or that he's just putting requests before God. It says that that man is literally wrestling in prayer for you. You know, because he, Epaphras is aware of the weaknesses of the congregations that he's ministering to. He knows, uh, you know, what are the temptations that they are facing and he's concerned for them. He doesn't want any of them to slip away and go back, you know, into their old ways. So he literally wrestles for them in prayer, just the way Jesus wrestled for Peter in prayer earlier. If you remember, you know, uh, um, Jesus speaks to Peter and he says, uh, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. So, yes, you will be tempted and the temptation will be very strong. In fact, uh, Jesus says to Peter, you will fall. You know, you will not be able to successfully withstand the temptation. But I have prayed for you. So you will come back. You will get back on your feet. You will have a future ministry. You will have a future hope in me. So in the same way, Jesus wrestled for Peter and, you know, secured his future. Epaphras was doing that for his people. He It looks like he was in charge of a, uh, three to four churches in that, you know, region where um, in, 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 you know, in, in all those places where he had planted uh, churches. And he was spending time in prayer, wrestling for all of those believers so that they would all stand firm in all the will of God, it says. Um, and in verse 13, Paul again repeats, he says, he's working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. So it looks like he had planted the churches in these three places. And he didn't just simply plant those churches and sit back and say, oh, I have done my task. No, he continued to pray for them. He continued to intercede for them. So church planting is a good thing to do. Uh, appointing leaders in those churches, you know, which have been planted, that's also good. But the apostle, the church planter, his job is not done after just appointing local leaders in those churches. He continues to um, uh, supervise those churches, continues to visit them, to encourage the leadership over there. And he wrestles in prayer for them so that all the believers over there will continue to stand firm. So when we look at these, um, these 
early church missionaries and leaders, they had a very different view of ministry. Now, you know, it's more about um, um, statistics. How many people uh, were you able to save? Uh, how many numbers have been uh, added to the church? And then if the numbers are right, then we are satisfied and we sit back. But you see, these early uh, ministers and leaders, it was not about statistics. It was about serving these people who have been added to the church and bringing them to a level where they have really been discipled. Because the Great Commission was not you know, to build up statistics. The Great Commission was to make people disciples. So discipling will involve a lot more than just, than just simply adding to the numbers. It will involve literally spending time with those numbers, with each of those numbers, so that they're no longer numbers, but they're actually people where you know about the issues that they are facing. You know about uh, where they are weak and where they are strong, so that you can uh, counsel them you know, in, in the right manner. So there's a lot more involved in ministry than just simply you know adding to the numbers in our congregations so on judgment day when the lord judges us and uh, you know um, uh, rewards us for all the things that we have done he will see what kind of ministry has been done so it's not just enough if i have built up a mega church god will also see in what way i have invested in the lives of the people in that mega church so it's just not enough that I have you know, uh, established a uh, mega church. God will want to know in what way I discipled the people in that mega church, how actively I was involved in their lives. So what God expects from ministry is something far greater. So um, um, to an extent, maybe it is good that we all have you know, a smaller uh, numbers of people to uh, disciple. It kind of makes it easier. Uh, not all of us, you know, run mega churches. Uh, thankfully, you know, um, most of us are maybe just in charge of a Bible study group, or uh, you know, we we just maybe teach a small group of people. So it it's easier to establish contact with them and you know keep in touch with them, bring them up, pray for them, encourage them. Uh, so when we do that, that would be considered through ministry. Um, and in verse 14, he next talks about Luke and Demas. He says, our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. So it's very sad. Here's Demas is sending his greetings to the church in Colossae. And then later we see that he drifts back into the world. That's That we would see that in 2 Timothy, where uh, Paul very sadly writes that Demas has gone back into the world. Uh, so uh, it's a warning you know, for us. Uh, it's in fact in Second Timothy four ten. This is what Paul says. He says, "For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica." So uh, he was drawn back into material things. I mean, that's quite a fall for someone who was in full time ministry, because full time ministry back then didn't really have any, you know, money or popularity or anything attached to it. It was something very tough at that time to be in ministry. So this man, Demas, along with Paul and the rest of the team, made a lot of sacrifices to, to serve the Lord and, and work full time and do all of that. But a man like that got drawn back into the world because he felt that you know, the ways of the world are easier, simpler, doesn't involve that much sacrifice. And he was drawn back into the world. So that should serve as a warning to us that no, today, while we are busy sending greetings to the people that you know we are ministering to, tomorrow we should not have drifted away and gone back looking for an easier way of life. So following Christ and carrying our cross every day will sometimes prove quite painful. It will involve a lot of sacrifice. But carrying that cross on a daily basis is worth it because Jesus said that such people are my true disciples. And so it is good for us to stick with the Lord until the end and remain his disciples so that, you know, we will enjoy the eternal reward that he has for us. Um, so that's regarding Demas. And then uh, we come to this very, you know, sad verses in 15, 16, um, where Paul says, give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea. 
and to Nympha and the church in her house. After this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. So Paul has sent a letter to Colosse and he has also sent a letter to the Laodiceans and he wants them to exchange the letters and read it out, you know, so that both the congregations will be familiar with all the instructions and all the encouragement that has been given in these letters. So it's very, very sad, you know, that we get to know later that the Laodiceans didn't really follow what was written in these letters. Now, we don't really know what the contents of the Laodicean letter was, but, you know, whatever was read out from the Colossian letter to the Laodicean people, they failed to keep it. So, you know, even as we were covering all these previous chapters of, uh, of Colossians and, you know, did we take those learnings to heart or are we in the, in the same condition as these Laodiceans who took those teachings lightly? You know, it went in through one year and went out through the other year. It didn't stay. It didn't take root. And so they, they, they ended up in a, in a very bad condition. If you remember, you know, when we were doing Colossians chapter 3, we talked about how, because now we have been raised with Christ, you know, we are, our, our mind should be on the things above. We are supposed to be seated with Christ. So we should, our mind should be where our spiritual status is, where our spiritual positioning is. If we are seated with Christ, our mind should also be on the things which are in the heavenlies rather than in the earthly realm. And in fact, Paul says, you know, in Colossians 3, he says, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. So he urges the, you know, throughout chapter 3, he gives a lot of instructions saying, you know, what are the things that they can do to continue to remain hidden in Christ? The Laodiceans did not take that seriously. And so in Revelation chapter 3, when Jesus is talking to them, he uses very, very strong words. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 17, Jesus says to them, You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. So Jesus says, that's what you people are saying about yourselves. And then Jesus says in verse 17, Revelation 3, 17, But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I mean... This was a church which thought that they were in a very secure, beautiful, comfortable position. Maybe they even said to themselves, look at the amount of wealth we have. It's because we are seated in the heavenlies with Christ. But Jesus who was looking at them could see the pathetic condition that they were in. He says, you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. Very strong terms. So... It is good for us to be doing, you know, um, these books, you know, th these epistles one by one. But if we don't take to heart the teachings which are there in these epistles and actually practice them, then we will be like the Laodiceans. You know, we may in fact have a lot of head knowledge about each of these epistles. We may even be able to write an essay, you know, on maybe one of these epistles. But where's the point if we have not practiced it and we have not stayed hidden in Christ? Then Jesus, who is looking at us, you know, will not look at our, uh, you know, Mark's certificate. Rather, he would look at the condition that we are in spiritually. And he may have end up saying to us, you are, yes, you have an, um, you know, APC certificate, but you are wretched, pitiful. And what a tragedy that would be. So in that Revelation 3, um, you know, uh, he, uh, you know, when I was uh, reading that, I was just kind of thinking in my mind, how would Epaphras have felt, you know, when he, when he, when he um, read this letter from John, you know, which John would have, you know, sent this letter to the Laodicean church. At that time, I wonder what Epaphras would have felt because he had wrestled in prayer for the Laodicean church. But these people had chosen to not follow the teachings. And uh, so in Revelation 3, in fact, Jesus gives them one more chance. He says, you know, um, um, buy from me gold refined in the fire. He says, you know, uh, that he will give them white clothes to wear so that they can cover their shameful nakedness, he says. 
and um, so at the, at the at the at the end of that uh, you know um, exhortation those the, that popular you know verse which we all know jesus speaks that in verse 20 revelation 320 and he says here i am i stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door i will come in and eat with that person and they with me so jesus is again coming back to them and saying i'm giving you one more chance to to live a life hidden in me because you have died with me you have died to the world don't go back to the things of the world and he gives them one more chance to come in and you know he says i will come into you and you have give you one more chance to hide your life in mine and keep your mind focused on heavenly things rather than earthly things and he says that if anyone chooses to respond to his voice and take this step i will give the right to sit with me on my throne so it's not enough that we are seated in the heavenlies with christ today what about in the future jesus is very very plain he says to the one who is victorious i will give the right to sit with me on my throne those who do not choose to stay hidden in christ those who act as if though they have not died to the world and you know who are still focusing on the things of the world they will not live victorious lives and jesus will not give them the right to sit with him on the throne so where's the point in being seated in the heavenlies um, you know um, in uh, in our spirit today if we can't physically sit with him that day on the throne you know so it will it would be such a tragedy so these are all things that we need to take very seriously um these epistles and the instructions given in them are meant even for us in the church today it these are not things which were just written for a church long ago these things apply even to us today and in the same way jesus was closely watching the colossian church the laodicean church is closely watching our churches today and i wonder what he is thinking in his mind about us and our churches so we need to be very careful about these things uh, because what he says that that counts his judgment regarding us counts the praise which people are heaping upon our church that secondary you know they may just look at the uh, look at us outwardly and say oh what a wealthy church or what a what a very pious church but what is god's ruling what is jesus ruling regarding our us and our churches this is something that we need to keep in mind so the colossian letter was read out to the laodiceans but they did not take it seriously uh, we do not know about the colossians themselves maybe they you know really applied those teachings to their lives and maybe they went on to really um, attain the glory which jesus had reserved for them so uh, with that uh, we kind of come to a conclusion you know with the colossian epistle um i'll switch off the recording and then you know we will get into the next epistle so we'll switch on the recording again